Hello everybody. Now we're going to look at a, um, a thing in the book, another uh, comprehension exercise, because that's all there is in this uh, book. We're going to have a look at page 110, 111, and I think it goes on a bit more, 112, 113, 114, ugh, 115. So it's quite a long one. Um, but it tempers the fact that it's very long by being incredibly boring. I'm not joking. So let me grab a seat because this is going to go on a bit. So, film crew in Lava Inferno. Now I have actually confirmed that this is a true story because I wasn't sure. Um, I looked it up on the uh, IMDB and the people who wrote this, uh, they really did. They really went out there and filmed, uh, tried to film this footage. And uh, you know, these, these are intelligent guys. These were guys who understand science and technology and, and helicopters. And they flew into a volcano and their helicopter crashed because they were stupid, which um, sort of makes me laugh. Um, anyway, so we're gonna have a look at this film crew in Lava Inferno. And the funniest thing about this is they almost died getting this footage that was never used. So they almost died for nothing. So. Have you ever wondered how film crews get such close-up shots of natural disasters? How do you think they get close-up shots of volcanoes? You're about to find out. Bet you can't wait. You're on the edge of your seats. Um, so I'll read, I'll read through, and then uh, you can do the questions. And then we'll do some more. And then we'll do even more. God, this goes on a bit. I forgot how much this goes on. <sighs> All right, let's just suck it down and let's get on with it. Film crew in Lava Inferno. Few things in nature match the forbidding power of a smoking volcano, threatening to unleash massive destruction with a terrifying roar and rumble. Its sinister might has become a potent symbol for movie makers. During the filming of Sliver in 1992, director Philip Noyce dispatched Hollywood film camera and Michael Benson, 42, and Chris Duddy, 31, to Pu'u'u'u in Hawaii's Volcan Volcanoes National Park to capture a steaming volcano in action. If you've never seen Sliver, you've probably never even heard of it, it's a weird movie about um, a guy who watches other people through, uh, through cameras around this apartment block. It's got nothing to do with volcanoes. There's no volcano in the movie at all. So what we've got is this director who's making a film that I think is entirely set inside this one apartment and uh, we're on apartment block. And he thought, oh, there's a volcano, a life-threatening event. Let's send these guys. So I don't know what they did, lose a bet, or if one of them was uh, sleeping with his sister or something, I don't know. But he sent them on a perilous journey to record footage that he didn't need. I, I don't know what the background of that is. Um, Madame Pile Benson, a veteran of films such as Patriot Games and Terminator 2, <coughs> also worth noting, neither of those have volcanoes in them, was a seasoned professional. He was also superstitious. Local folklore told a fearsome goddess named Madame Pile who lurked within the volcano's fiery cone. Oh dear, oh dear. Uh, she was reputed to be very fond of gin. I'm sorry. Um, so, as a gesture of goodwill, the crew brought a bottle with them to throw into the crater, hoping to ensure their safety and good weather for filming. So these intelligent guys are taking a helicopter, a helicopter, let's be honest, a fairly reasonable symbol of scientific achievement. This is a machine that can fly using technological means, and they're going to fly up against a goddess and try and placate her with a bottle of cheap gin. I mean, you, you're reading this correctly. I mean, I'm, I'm not just making this up. Um, this, this is the level of intelligence that they're dealing with here. On the morning of Saturday, November the 21st, they hired pilot Craig Hoskins, 34, not that that's relevant, and his Belljet Ranger helicopter and flew from Hilo Bay Airfield to, I'm not even gonna try and pronounce that. The weather was damp and foggy and showed little sign of clearing as they approached the ash-strewn summit. Below, a steaming, bubbling cauldron lurked within a jagged, disfigured peak. Corrosive, choking gases venting from the glowing lava pits inside the massive crater cast thick clouds over the volcano, making it almost impossible to see. 
You don't look at this, do you? You don't think, ah, oh, a bubbling volcano, horrendous danger, clouds of corrosive smoke that burn up everything. You don't think, ooh, let's pack a sandwich and let's go and have a look at that. You just, I don't know what is wrong with these people. Um, even in the relative comfort and safety of a helicopter, this is a Belgette Ranger. It's made of plastic and fiberglass. The, the windows are made of this really thick, not much stronger than this. So in the relative safety of the helicopter, the fumes caught in the men's throats. <laughs> oh my God. Oh God. So they're flying around inside the safety of a helicopter as if the helicopter is sort of straining out these gases and it says it's making them cough. So they know they're in danger. Um, and they made their first pass over the rim. Benson lobbed the gin bottle into the crater. Oh well, we've thrown in some gin, it'll all be good. <laughs> Engine trouble. Uh, gaps in the clouds came and went, allowing Benson and Duddy to shoot some film. But as they prepared to make a final flight over before returning home, the helicopter engine began to sputter. Hoskins, wide-eyed with alarm, wrestled with the controls, desperate to avoid landing inside the steaming crater. But he was fighting a losing battle, and the craft was heading straight over the rim. Narrowly missing a deep pool of glowing lava in the middle of the crater, he tried to direct the stricken helicopter to a flat rock ledge. Oh, excuse me. Oh, this is exciting stuff, isn't it? Crash landing. As they pitched and rolled, the rotor hit the ground and shattered. Told you, all plastic. The craft dropped with a sickening thud and broke in half. Uh, Benson, Duddy and Hoskins scrambled out battered over, uh, uninjured, battered but in, uninjured and found themselves in a hellish environment. Although they were fortunate enough to have landed on a thin crust of solid rock, the heat of the molten lava beneath penetrated through their boots. Who would have thought that the heat of molten rock would be hot? An intense and constant roar filled their ears as pools of lava bubbled and boiled and steam hissed and spluttered from cracks in the ground. Clouds of acrid gas drifted by and the men could barely see their hands in front of their faces. They're lucky their eyes weren't melting. Uh, no chance of rescue. <laughs> I, love the, uh, I love the headlines here. Crash landing. Oh, I wonder what happened next. No chance of rescue. <gasps> the drama. Within the shattered cockpit, the radio was dead. There was no chance of immediate rescue. They were not expected back for another hour. The obvious option was to head for the rim, 50 meters above. The rocky surroundings they scrambled through regularly gave way to deep ash and crumbling stone and they sank knee deep into hot black soot. After about 15 minutes the three had climbed halfway up the slope to the top but could go no higher. The rock ahead rose to 45 degrees then jutted into an overhanging rim that looked almost impassable. Wow. Radio repair. See now they're making it sound like no chance of rescue, radio repair. I wonder what happened next. It seemed impossible to get out without assistance, but all three knew that no one, no one would see them in the crater. Hoskin had one reckless idea. He would go back to the helicopter and try to repair the radio. Benson tried to persuade him not to return. Oh, God, I'm so excited. Uh, since the craft was enveloped in poisonous choking fumes, but Hoskins knew he had no option. Wrapping his shirt around his face to keep out the worst of the acrid air, he returned to the helicopter. Wow. Okay, I'm going to give you some time to answer the questions and then we'll come back and we'll go through what I think are the answers. Yes, hello. Yeah, I'd like to hire a helicopter. Yeah, we're gonna go and find a volcano. No, no, it'll be perfectly safe because we'll throw some gin into the volcano. Yeah. Hello? Hello? 
Oh, he hung up. Okay, explain forbidding power in your own words. Well, obviously that's in your words. In my words, it means uh, a great deal of power. Power so, so powerful that it, it's irresistible. Um, what was the name of the volcano and where was it? It was uh, Madame Pile, and it was somewhere in Hawaii in poo ooh ooh something like that, I don't care. Um, what kind of person is a seasoned professional? Um, a professional, obviously, someone who knows what they're doing, somebody who, uh, who is very business-like, somebody that's not an amateur, obviously professional, the opposite of that is an amateur, someone who's not doing it and getting paid. A professional literally means you're getting paid, seasoned means you have a great deal of experience. So this is someone who knows what they're doing. What is the noun derived from reputed uh, reputation? obviously. On what date did this accident occur? I'm sure it's written there somewhere. Uh, during the filming of uh, Sliver in 1992, November the 21st. Sunday. <laughs> Sunday. Saturday, sorry. Yeah. Okay, you shouldn't, see according to Jewish law, you shouldn't be working Saturday. So, there you go. Now you know. Um, they were in, Relative comfort and safety. What is this compared to? <laughs> relative comfort and safety inside the helicopter relative to outside the helicopter. Uh, other words, inside the volcano. <laughs> Brilliant question. What evidence is there that cameraman Michael Benson was worried about their safety? Um, oof, that's a good one. Michael Benson. Uh, shoot some film, blah, blah, blah. Crash landing. Oh, is this? Uh, okay, is this to be refunded? Gin. He's the one who brought the gin, isn't he? Yeah, he brought the gin. He was worried about their safety, so he brought a bottle of gin. I just can't believe how just ridiculous this is. Uh, what was the first indication that the helicopter had a problem? It crashed. That's usually a, a sign of trouble. Um, describe the sensations the men felt um, and what they heard when they crash landed in the crater. They felt a lot of heat. They heard sizzling and bubbling and they were just hoping it wasn't their own skin. Explain why the men could not climb out of the volcano by themselves. Uh, well, it was hot, it was crumbling and, uh, and they're only people and their skin was probably melting off their fingers by this point. Um, Okay, let's continue reading the passage. Help on the way. See, again, really badly titled. I wonder what could happen. I wonder if help was on the way. Oh, help on the way. Okay. Um, we could just read these. One out, desperate move, uh, night supplies, net rescue. I wonder what's going to happen. Now we know. We know the entire story. Uh, Hoskins could only work at the radio for short bursts, emerging occasionally to climb to a clearer spot and breathe some fresher air, but he managed to take the film camera battery and hook it to the radio, and after a grim hour, he was able to fix it. An SOS call caught the attention of colleagues back at the base. Within an hour, pilot Don Shearer, who had often worked on rescue missions in the Hawaii area, was flying over the volcano. Shearer, in radio contact with Hoskins, reported that he could see nothing in the smoking crater. Hoskins would have to guide him in, peering blindly into the swirling smoke. Hoskins could now faintly hear the dull throbbing of rotor blades and was able to bring Shearer down close by. As the craft hovered a couple of feet above the ground, Hoskins leapt inside and watched the clouds of smoke swirl away beneath him as the helicopter lifted away to safety. One out. One man at least had escaped the clutches of Madame Pile. Told you, Madame Pile. Uh, but Benson and Duddy were still awaiting rescue, crouching on a ledge halfway up the crater. They had noticed the helicopter's arrival and were distressed to hear its engines recede into the distance. But above them, help had arrived from another quarter. Hoskins' radio SOS had been picked up by the local National Park Rangers. Two rangers had climbed up the tip of the rim and were trying to spot the survivors. So deadly was the atmosphere around the volcano summit that the rangers had to wear gas masks and acidic fumes corroded their climbing ropes. Benson and Duddy could hear faint shouts from their would-be rescuers above the roar of the lava pits. Waving frantically, they shouted themselves hoarse. But the cloudy fumes were too thick and their muffled echoed, uh, voices echoed around the rim, making it impossible for them to be located. 
The rangers threw down ropes in the vague hope that one would land near the trapped men, but this was unsuccessful. I can't make this more exciting, I'm sorry. Darkness fell and the rescuers gave up, intending to return the next morning. Night began, uh, brought torrential rain and the next day the weather was even rougher. Don Shearer was no longer able to help because the helicopter had been damaged by corrosive fumes when he rescued Hoskins and it was now unsafe to fly. On the rim of the crater, the rangers could hardly see three meters in front of them. The day wore on and Benson and Duddy faced another night in the crater to be baked by glowing lava and frozen by lashing rain. Choked by fumes, their eyes uh, streaming, the two had only their shirts to wrap around their faces to protect them from the poisonous surroundings. Desperate move. By mid-afternoon on the second day in the crater, Duddy could take no more. Maybe there was another way out. Whatever happened, trying to escape was better than sitting there suffocating. Benson, who was older and not so confident of his climbing abilities, decided to stay where he was. Daddy's gamble paid off. After an exhausting climb through crumbling rock and sooty gravel, he eventually made it to the top and was rescued by park rangers. He shouted down to Benson and his voice was lost in the huge, hollow cauldron. This could do with a little comedy, you know, a little comedy to lighten the mood. Uh, night supplies. Night was now falling and, for want of any better plan of action, the rangers tossed food and water packets into the rim, hoping that Benson might stumble on one. But the well-meaning gesture only brought him more misery. Seeing one of the packages fall through the mist, he thought it was Duddy falling to his death and was overwhelmed by guilt for bringing his crew here at all. Perhaps he didn't bring enough gin. Again, it rained for most of the night and Benson, who had uh, not found any of the packets tossed to him, was weakening fast. Breathing was now a painful effort. His mouth was so dry he could no longer call for help and the fumes were causing him to hallucinate. He battled with a raging thirst, catching rain in, in, the, in, his, in the face of his camera light meter and drinking a mouthful at a time. But help was on its way from yet another quarter. Overnight, Benson's colleague had managed to contact helicopter pilot Tom Hoptman, famed for his daring rescues. Soon after uh, first light, Hoptman, Hauptman? flew over the crater and for the first time through a temporary gap in the clouds he managed to spot Benson who waved frantically back. Hoptman's helicopter was equipped with a large net and this was dangled down. Oh god, oh, excuse me. It was like a fishing in a muddy pool for Hopman, who could only guess where Benson was as the clouds obscured his view. Twice the net went down and twice it came up empty, but on the third attempt it landed right in front of the ailing cameraman. He saw his chance and lunged into it, intense relief flooding through him as the helicopter pulled away from the crater. He was safe at last. And now, questions. Sounds like someone's skinning a cat. <clears throat> right, questions, number 11. Why did Benson feel guilty about the accident? I'm gonna assume it's because he didn't bring enough gin. Um, oh, because he killed everybody. Um, there's two problems the fumes caused on the second night. Uh, they were getting very hot, they were poisonous, they were stopping the helicopter coming there, they were killing people, they were choking to death, oh, etc. There's two problems, oh, I'm sorry. Explain how Benson was rescued. Um, I can't remember. Wasn't it, wasn't it by the uh, things, the, the rangers? The rangers threw down ropes. Something like that, I don't care. Uh, 14, uh, for each of these words from the passage, give one word or short phrase which has the same meaning. Dispatched, killed. That's actually true. Dispatch means uh, to send out, 
So I can dispatch a letter. I can also kill somebody, and that's called dispatching as well. Uh, penetrated, uh, penetrated, um, one word. A synonym of penetrate is, uh, hmm, can't think of a single word there. Penetrated, uh, intruded, cut into, broke into. Uh, enveloped, surrounded, uh, recede, to pull back, to go away, to drift, to uh, go out. Vague, uh, uncertain, gamble, chance, overwhelmed, uh, beaten, uh, colleagues, accomplices. Um, why do cameramen and helicopter pilots take such risks? Because uh, they can. Realistically, um, the spirit of adventure, we, we, we push ourselves. Um, as a writer, I, I push myself, I try and do more. Um, I would imagine any professional does the same, especially artists, always pushing to do a little bit better. Um, and, and, we, and I actually respect these people for what they did. They went out there and they tried to get a, an impressive shot. Um, the problem with this writing is, as I said yesterday, there's no odds. We know they escaped. We already know how this story ends, so we don't care about it. Also, um, it's in the school book, so we don't care. Um, it's just, it should have been presented in a, in a more interesting way. Um, it just doesn't work like this. Uh, evaluate the men's attempts to save themselves and describe their uh, attitude towards survival. Desperate, I would say. I would say that their attempts to save themselves were weak, apart from the guy who went back and fixed the radio. That was pretty cool. Um, although it doesn't sound like the radio was broken, it sounds like the helicopter was broken and it didn't have any electrical supply to the radio, so they just bodged it. Um, that was pretty cool, going back and doing that. The other guys just seemed a bit desperate, and they probably made it worse. If they'd have stayed together, they would have all been rescued. They, this desperate wandering off in different directions um, could have got people killed. And not just them, the rescuers too. So that was pretty stupid, to be honest. How would you react if you felt, found yourself in this situation? Um, realistically, if somebody put me in this situation, I would stay home and drink the gin, and we'd just call it quits. That's it. That's what I would do. Um, and, and I tell you, this is a very, very stupid question because you don't know. Nobody knows how they would deal with a life-threatening or even dangerous situation until you've actually been in it. Um, I've, I've been in situations that are tense and everybody reacts differently and they never react the way that they say they're going to. Uh, you don't know what you would do until you've actually been in a position like this. So I, I don't think that question is worth answering for most people. Um, you, you kind of know whether you're the sort of person to put yourself at risk like this uh, already. And, and actually I am because I, I ride motorcycles to the edge of mountains and all that kind of stuff. Um, I do all sorts of stupid things just because I want to. So I, I probably would have put myself in this position. Um, I probably would have written a funnier story about it though. So yeah, I, I don't think you would know. I don't think, I don't even think it's worth asking that question because you just simply don't know. Um, what I do know is that I tend to be a more natural leader. I would have, I would have tried to get an organized plan before just wandering off in different directions. I would have tried to find a logical plan. I would have discussed it with the pilot. Uh, is there any eventuality for this? Is there uh, any kind of formula? You know, we're expecting a rescue. How long before we can expect a rescue? Do we have any emergency flare or signaling equipment? Um, what's the opportunities for rescue? Local park rangers, uh, helicopters, what can we do? What can we do to get out of this situation? And I'd start a rational um, plan to try and get us out of it. Probably staying inside the helicopter would have been a smarter move as well, because at least you've got some sealed uh, against the fumes. Um, that would seem to be more logical, unless the helicopter was melting. Uh, and you've got the radio, you've got the electronics. Uh, you could set fire to the helicopter, which would make a plume of black smoke. Maybe you'd get seen. Uh, you've got the fuel on board as well, which could be used to light a, a torch. The helicopter would seem to be the place to be, and you don't want to split up. You need the people to stay together. So, so there, there seems to be things that they could have done but didn't, and I think if somebody had actually just thought this through logically, they would have had a less interesting story, but definitely a better chance of survival. 
Uh, as it turns out, nobody had any lasting injuries. All they ended up with was a good story. So, so nobody was killed doing this. It all seems to me to be very unnecessary. The movie Sliver was an absolute uh, pile of crap, to be honest. It was just a garbage film about garbage people. Um, it was kind of a sort of romantic uh, adult movie drama, and it was just garbage. Um, I, I only saw a few minutes of it and thought, oh, this is terrible. Um, and, and there was no need for a volcano shot. Uh, all I can think of is that they were trying to put it in as a, as an, a background news story. You know, so it was running on the television in the background, a shot of a volcano. This is totally unnecessary. Uh, nobody needed to go through this. It was just stupid. Um, the only other thing I can think of is uh, use the budget. If, if I was the director and there was a, a volcano going off nearby and I had these people working for me, um, on my, for, for my money, um, maybe I would have sent them off to get footage because I can sell the footage and that would earn me back the budget for the movie. So maybe that's what they were thinking. Maybe they were thinking, you know, we've got this opportunity to get these, this thing filmed and that footage will be worth a lot of money, so it offsets the cost of making this movie. Maybe that was what was actually going on. I, I don't know. Um, you'd have to do a lot more research, but I think I, I, I don't think there's anyone that would really remember the story that well. Um, as I say, I looked it up on IMDb, and the, you know, the story's over. It's finished. In 1992, so so 30 years ago, this was this was over, uh, and nobody died. So you know, it's kind of finished. But I would imagine there was a there was an element of selling the footage is what this was all about. So okay, that's it for today. Thanks very much.